Hey, Retcon Raider here. Today's video is dedicated to the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible. With special thanks to Nine Knives, Revenant, Eloise, A Nerd in Warpaint, Dragon Matrix 7, Excelsior, Goatlieb, Kazorn, Lima, Nathan Welch Jr., Thomas Piatkowski, and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. And welcome back to Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous. As we settle in for another nice, relaxing lore dump episode. Retcon reader? Nah, whatever you want to call it. Essentially, we're just kicking back at the Defender's Heart, and we're going to peruse the Baker's Dozen of assorted lore books that we've accrued over the past several episodes. Not the most exciting episode, I suppose, which is why it's segregated from the others. But uh, I do like doing these. Aside from just being entertaining, a lot of these books do essentially serve as sort of a Cribs Note version of uh, the numerous source books for the Pathfinder setting that have been released in the past. I mean, obviously it's not comprehensive, but it does specifically focus on providing context for, for things that may be specifically relevant to the current campaign that we're working our way through. And in some cases to to events from Kingmaker, which, of course, was the game that preceded this one. They did recycle a few of these books between games, and um, I am uncertain if that information is still relevant for this one. That said, kick back, relax, grab a beverage or two, and we'll just start working our way down the list. I'll try to tag in reference images and text blurbs as appropriate, and uh, we'll pause for discussion after each book. But uh, I figure we should be done with this in under an hour. Here we go. A journal about an experiment. Experiment, day one. Today I was able to catch a quasit. At Rory be my witness, it wasn't easy, considering my humble physical condition. Luckily it was a scrawny specimen, about seven pounds with a wingspan of about two and one-third feet. When it awoke, the quasit first tried to attack me, and then ruined my clothes with his caustic saliva. Experiment, day three. I have begun my linguistics research. My goal is to study the language of quasits. I'm quite convinced they have their own dialect. Through understanding their speech, I will be able to understand their way of thinking and convince them to rebel against their lord's tyranny. A revolution will roll through the abyss, and the powerless will rebel against their oppressors. I'm sure that Everbloom Milani will not refuse her patronage, even to such creatures as these, if they would break their chains of slavery. Unfortunately, progress is thus far insignificant. I've been able to catalog only two words, which I suspect must mean rend and carry on. The quasit formed both words quite vividly when commenting on my person. While I was entering this record, the quasit managed to steal my watch and throw it into the chamber pot. Judging by his spiteful giggling, he's quite delighted about his little joke. And despite the naughty trick, I am somewhat glad. Jokes and pranks are a part of the cognitive communication, which I fully intend to establish with the specimen. I grow more and more convinced that I made the right decision in leaving Absalom and Foray Logos, the so-called wise house. More like narrow-minded fools stuck in the past, under the sway of their ringleader, that chatterbox, the fool of fools, Jubilost Narthropple. Hey, we know him. They've never appreciated the progressive nature of my theories. Experiment, day four. Today, the quasit almost bit my nose off while I fed him. In response to my shame, I beat him with a wand. Such behavior toward sentient beings is unacceptable, and I repent deeply. I've also run out of meat. The specimen and I will have to make do with porridge and soup. Experiment, day six. It's been three days since the specimen switched to a vegetarian diet. At first, the quasit refused to eat plant-based food but then ate some cabbage soup and poked at the porridge with his claw. His face looked so tragic. Experiment, day seven. The specimen has completely lost all signs of aggression. At dawn, I was awoken by his moaning. The quasit was rolled up in a ball in the corner, whimpering. 
Despite his dangerous appearance, it's quite impossible not to feel compassion towards the poor creature. I had to take prompt measures and give the specimen a laxative potion. The closet now reacts to me with confusion and fear, but at least it's not suffering anymore. His gastrointestinal tract must have reacted unhappily to the unfamiliar diet. Experiment. Day 10. What a great day. The switch to a completely plant-based diet is complete. The theory that Quasits can only eat meat and carry on has been disproven. My eternal opponent, Sir Jubilost, will just have to go drown himself in a river. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. That, that's how they do things in academic circles, right? The Quasit has become peaceful and easygoing. He no longer tries to eat my boots or the feet inside them. The specimen's behavior has become gentle and friendly. He shows some interest in ball games and physical exercise. I have named him... Pecker. Uh-huh. Today, he initiated communication and attempted to explain a new word to me. By all evidence, he was making up the word during the communication process, for there has never been such a word in the Quasit language. The meaning, as I understand it, is safety, comfort, and calm. I see no further need to keep Pecker on his chain. This experiment has convinced me that the vicious and evil traits attributed to Quasits are acquired habits, not natural or inherent to their nature. Over these days, I really have grown fond of him, and by all evidence, Pecker likes me too. He's gotten used to napping on my knee while I'm writing my observations in my journal. Maybe someday this Quasit will become my familiar. The current stage of the experiment is complete. Pecker and I are soon to be off to Absalom to present our findings before the professors at 4A Logos and become a scientific sensation. On our way, we uh, may make a small detour to Avistan so that Pecker will have a chance to better adapt to civilization. I hope the little trickster enjoys the journey. Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that that did not end up going the way this guy hoped it would. Uh, for context, we found this journal in the Shadow Demon House in the Canabras Market Square. Upper floor, not too far from a bloodied corpse. Which, uh, is probably the guy who wrote the journal. Though there's no guarantee. I mean, who knows, maybe we will end up encountering this mysterious anonymous wizard and his familiar pecker someday. I suppose there's also the possibility that this is all one extended, um dirty joke about a man who could not control his pecker, but um, I feel like that's not quite Owlcat style, though if it was uh, In Exile or Larian, for example, I could definitely see it being the case. Uh, side note, we've got some name drops here, though uh, nothing I think that would be directly relevant to this particular campaign, the biggest being Jubilos Narthropel. Genius, writer, gnomish alchemist potential companion and Pathfinder Kingmaker, and uh, possibly pushing up worms, depending on depending on what the canon ending for that particular adventure is. We also got name drops for Irori and Milani, the gods of self-perfection and rebellion against oppression, respectively, which I think really just goes towards the uh, caster's mindset when he embarked on that ill-advised experiment. A Thousand Revolutions For the third night in a row, I've dreamt of the great gardeners knocking at my door. I cannot believe it is my turn, to be cut down by a blade washed in the blood of a thousand revolutions, as a wave of popular outrage washes over me, as my head tumbles down the steps of the scaffold. We take up the sword, and by it we shall perish. Once we struck down the imperial scum, but... Now it is we who must face the blade. The insurgent beast called Revolution will never be sated. It needs new victims. This time it's my comrades and I. The cruelty of the hoarders in power echoes in the cruelty of the paupers, now intoxicated by their own freedom. We wanted change? Well, here it is. This is a country now of mad fanatics, fighting their treacherous past every day. Former friends are today's foes. My workshop has been converted into a secret headquarters. If I could do it all over again, I would repair to my easel and refrain from the cause that has sent me down this path. 
Interesting. So that is obviously a nod to Galt, the Kingdom of Perpetual Revolution. Uh, not sure it's really relevant to this campaign. That's more of a Kingmaker thing. I believe Galt is east of the River Kingdoms and does not share a border with the World Wound. Though the revolutions did start around the same time the World Wound opened, which is more, more related to the death of Aridin, the god of humans, than it is with the World Wound itself. Uh, the very short Cribs Note version is... It was once a vassal state of Cheliax, but they united to throw off the yoke after Aridin's death. But then they just never stopped fighting. A new ruler pops up every few years, finds themselves opposed by new groups, and then once their uh, public support starts to wane, the Grey Gardeners pop up and execute them. They're really uh, too preoccupied with their own business to get involved in anyone else's. The Adventures of a Fearless Crusader Brie, the Sausage Maker, by Berthamel from Patax, the Sharpwood Publishing Company. For dinner, the wounded were served cabbage soup. This didn't surprise them in the slightest. They'd had the same dish for dinner for a week. The hospital's residents used to be lucky enough to get potatoes and even turnips sometimes. But about a month ago, the Knights of the Order of the Thrice Holy Shining Sun and Dissipating Darkness Scimitar of our beloved goddess Serenre accidentally shot a catapult the wrong direction and annihilated the cart of the farmer who supplied the hospital with these vegetal delicacies. Ever since, the wounded only had cabbage soup for dinner, occasionally with a bit of protein when the odd cockroach crawled into the pot. Yeah, we've, uh, we've all been there. After enjoying their delightful meal, the wounded stuffed their smoking pipes with something which rather more resembled hay than tobacco. Their bad habits demanded the inhalation of some smoke or other after mealtime, but with these practical matters happily resolved, they fell to talking. "'Which demon do you think is the most dangerous?' asked Wuzlik, the spearman, scratching the stub of his leg with the stub of his arm. "'I think it's Abercandaloos. Those monsters are cunning and sneaky, almost like Varesians. And their teeth are even sharper. Look!' He illustrated his point for his comrades, by holding up his remaining fingers, two and a half of them. "'It depends on the way you look at it,' answered Gregly, the artillerist, though she could hardly look at it at all. Her eyes were covered with bandages. "'Your Abracandaloos are easy pickings, but Baylor's are a different thing. He hits you with his whip, and your eyes pop out.' She waved her pipe energetically, casting its contents into Wuzlik's face. While the latter was coughing and brushing himself off, Briggy joined the conversation. Maylors and Bricandaloos are all right, I suppose, but I'd say there isn't a demon in the world scarier than a regular louse. Of course, the other demons can teleport places, but the louse doesn't even need to do that. Wherever you look, it's already there. Then he stuck his hand under his shirt, pulled out the subject of his speech from somewhere in his armpit, and demonstrated it to his friends. You can run away from a big demon with a whip, but who can run away from lice? They sting everyone, from the foot soldier to the general. Even the queen herself isn't immune. Now you might say it doesn't do much harm, after all, how much blood can one louse drink? But I'm telling you, think about how much soldier's blood they've drunk altogether. It's got to be a whole sea, wouldn't you think? More than all the demons in the abyss. And if anyone tells me a louse isn't a demon, then ha-ha to them. Could a monster like that come from anywhere besides the abyss? Okay, first of all, um, I am fairly certain that Briggy is supposed to have, like, a Scottish accent, and I'm not even going to pretend I can do that. Um, also, this story was not at all what I was expecting. I really thought it was going to be an oddball, humorous story about uh, about a sausage maker turned crusader or maybe it maybe like a horror piece about a sausage maker grimly using their craft by turning suspect meat into um, nourishing food stuff for crusaders but uh, this was something else entirely I'm honestly not sure I know what to make of this I do like the uh, overly elaborate name for that that seemingly inept church of uh, Sarenray. 
In fact, the um, whole piece has kind of a tone of deliberate parody, which would be pretty fitting for a piece coming out of attacks. That said, lice do suck. Battle in the Valley of Fire by Luris Aldori Bargain was knocked flat. He lay gasping, arms spread, a lump of rage rising in his throat. He remembered his dream. Black soil, red ravens, and the empty sky. The coarse croaks ringing in his ears like a taunt. Coral would never take Rosland. Never! Aldori sprang to his feet, as if the blood-soaked soil was driving him forward. With a cry of rage, the Sword Lord rushed into the battle. The sky turned scarlet with blood as he furiously chopped off his enemies' heads. The scarlet horizon drew closer, and its roar nearly drowned out the sounds of battle. Argon looked to the sky, and a fiery blast descended upon him. These were no ravens that circled above him. The fearsome breath of the red dragons of coral melted the soldier's armor and turned living flesh to ash and dust. Ah, and that's another uh, Cribs Note version, a very brief version of the conquering of the Aldori Sword Lords at the hands of uh, Coral the Conqueror. It's been quite a while, but we got a crash course in that from Jamandi Aldori all the way back at the beginning of Kingmaker. Wow. Again, uh, not directly relevant to what we're doing here, but uh, still interesting nonetheless, especially since I'm sure there will be... Um, some degree of diplomacy with Bravoy and uh, the Sword Lords in particular as we get further into the campaign. They do, they do throw in some support to the Crusades, I believe. In fact, uh, we've already met an Aldori in the current campaign, so maybe it's more relevant than I thought. Uh, Sila's friend, Janna Aldori. She's one of the members of the Order of the Cart, Cooking Almanac of the Inner Sea by Jubilost Narthropple. One moment. It is perhaps Avistan's most popular dish. In the capital of Cheliax, it is baked in a cheese crust and sprinkled with lemon juice. The local fishermen use a different cooking method in Kadira, which is on the opposite end of Avistan. There you will find it finely chopped and mixed with cold ingredients. The exact origin of the dish remains unknown, but it is generally believed to have been invented in Andoran and spread around the globe by seafarers and pilgrims. It served as plain pâté in its most basic version. To prepare it, soak the herring in spiced marinade, then mince it into a spreadable paste. Add a mashed tart green apple, hard-boiled quail eggs, the freshest butter you can find, and half an onion. The list of ingredients may vary in the inland regions. In the region of near Mathis, beef or lamb is used for this snack. I once tasted a highly original and equally highly disgusting version cooked with milk and mushrooms on the border of Druma. Ah, uh, Jubilost. You know, I really wanted to uh, use him more in our Kingmaker run, but it just felt too redundant to have a, a pair of alchemists in the same party. Though, I mean, there would be no denying the the sheer raw firepower potential of that pairing. I suppose in a lot of ways that Nenio is essentially intended to be our stand-in for Jubilost in Wrath, but I don't feel like she hits quite the same balance. They're both obnoxious in their, their self-perceived intellectual superiority, but I feel like Jubilost had a lot more redeeming features, whereas Nenio is portrayed as a lot more amoral, and short-sighted in her pursuits. Though she is still entertaining in her own way. And uh, I imagine she's got something weird going on with that memory thing. Most likely uh, to do with her her casual worship of Nethys, the uh, insane god of magic. Sadly, as much as I would absolutely love to see Jubilost, I sincerely doubt he'll make any in-person appearances in Wrath. As aforementioned, his fate is left deliberately nebulous post-Kingmaker. The storyteller over there did did confirm the broad strokes of the Kingmaker campaign, but it appears that Owlcat is deliberately avoiding establishing any specific canon details. Fairy Tales of Avistan A long, long time ago, 
In a time before remembering, there was a furious god known as Rovagug, a terrible giant worm with a thousand teeth and claws. He devoured every world in his path, one after another. But the great gods were displeased with the beast and delivered unto Rovagug their scourge. Many laid down their feuds to combine forces. Mighty Torag, Brilliant Sarenray, Vicious Asmodeus, Crafty Callistria, Cold-Blooded Phrasma, and many, many others. Together, they faced Rovagug as he arrived to swallow Galerion. The goddess of the sun, Sarenray, forbade Rovagug's death, and so the gods imprisoned the fiend deep in the ground, shackled and sleeping. Asmodeus himself would keep the keys to his bonds. The terrible monster remains there still, asleep in his prison. When Rovagug rolls over in his sleep and scratches his back against his prison walls, the earth trembles and volcanoes spit fire. Ah, Rovagug. Every pantheon's got to have a, an entity of raw, mindless destruction, I suppose. Though, I, I suppose Rovagug might not be entirely mindless. He has come up with various clever clever schemes to release at least a fraction of his power over the years in the form of the spawn of Rovagug. Uh, he does somewhat share a cross-purpose with Grotus, another lesser entity that's imprisoned in Phrasma's Boneyard, I believe. That, of course, is the god of end times, who is someday destined to oversee the end of Galerion. That's the entity that uh, Harem worshipped back in Kingmaker. Rovagug is a threat that is, of course, well beyond the scope of any standard campaign. As the uh, embodiment of mindless hunger and destruction, he has devoured numerous worlds and killed countless long-forgotten gods. Even Phrasma fears him, so it is peculiar that Sarenray would insist that, that he be spared when they finally got the upper hand on him. That does somewhat smack of how Phrasma keeps Grotus around, despite the fact that his purpose is an inherently negative one. Though, at least in Phrasma's case, uh, you could accredit that to her playing some sort of very long game. She and uh, one other entity, uh, Yogg Sothoth, I believe, one of the Lovecraftian gods, are the only survivors from a previous multiverse. So, um, keeping entities like Grotus and uh, Rovagug around may be part of her exit plan or something, just in case this multiverse ever starts going under. She's rebuilt everything from scratch before, so in, in theory, she could do it again. A Guide for Travelers, Hunters, and Explorers of the River Kingdoms, Volume 5, Monsters and Beasts. Will-O-Wisp, an amusing glowing ball which looks harmless and doesn't arouse any natural suspicion pretends to be a guiding light in the marshes, but leads travelers to certain death. The agonizing fear of their victims is this monster's nourishing dinner. If you manage to resist their tricks, make sure you have some electrical protection. The monster electrocutes any visitors it fails to lure into terror. Werewolf Werewolves prefer to hunt in groups and attack lone travelers. It's entirely possible that a Vriesen camp or troop could turn into a pack of bloodthirsty lycanthropes under cover of darkness. Ordinary weapons stand little chance against them, but a silver blade greatly increases your chances of survival. Primals Powerful creatures of the primal realm occasionally visit this world for amusement. It's best to stay out of a primal's way. Don't fight it, it's extremely dangerous. But if a life is at stake, resort to cold steel. Okay, okay, so this feels like another carryover from the Kingmaker campaign. The advice it's giving here is definitely a lot a lot better suited for the enemy set we would have encountered in Kingmaker, as opposed to the demons and cultists we're running into here in the World Wound. It's been a while, but uh, as I recall, Will-O-Wisps were a prominent foe faced in certain areas like... Oh, um... Candlekeep? No, no, that's Baldur's Gate. Uh, Candlemere. Candlemere Tower. Yeah, that was quite an adventure. One of the uh, more notable ones, I think. Even though it wasn't part of the main quest. In fact, I think that one involved uh, Primal as well. 
and the first appearance of Willis Gunderson. That rep scallion, uh, who uh, also got a nod earlier in this campaign. I believe he was the subject of the play that the Next Door Theater was rehearsing when we first found them in that uh, storm cellar. And uh, he was also the the staple character of the Varnhold's Lot DLC, which I do need to get around to finishing. We were just four or so episodes from wrapping that up. And then werewolves, obviously. Uh, there was that uh, werewolf ranger, the poor guy who lost his family and cast himself to wolves in hopes that it would end his life, only to come back as something worse. And then the primals, of course. Those were essentially the uh, main foes, as I recall, in Kingmaker. I do need to get back to that game at some point. It's on my to-do list. It's just a matter of finding the two or three hundred hours it would take to actually finish the series. Anyway, uh, interesting stuff. Not really relevant to our campaign, though uh, who knows, maybe we will encounter a few of these things throughout Wrath. Moving on. In Search of Joy, Confessions of a Heretic. I take a deep breath and stand still. I long to absorb every moment of joy, inhale the evaporation of someone else's soul from their thickening blood. The border between reality and dream fades. It seems that everyone beyond the wall can hear the throbbing in my head, but it's only my fantasy. A ringing silence fills the room. The fifth sacrifice has been made. My mistress, the most beautiful of goddesses, will be happy. I will take care of everything. Fragrant flowers cut at the climax of their beauty are now a part of the masterpiece, which is worthy of Shailen herself. So what if the narrow-minded priest rejected me and my gift? I serve the never-fading Rose herself, not the worms that bite into her stem and suck at her life-giving juices. Inappropriate. It won't be long now before I finish my job. I've already found the material. Her eyes are gray. The hair is dark blonde. She is fading into the dirt. I will rewrite her destiny. Intriguing. So, based on the context here, what it looks like we have is a would-be servant of Shailen, who is apparently resorting to necromancy in a misguided effort to impress Shailen, the goddess of beauty. From the sound of it, they were trying to um, bring back some unfortunate girl who is likely cut down before her time, which is the staple of many a horror story, I think. It's made even more interesting here, however, because, um, of course, Zan Kuthan, the Dark Prince of Pain, is Shailen's half-brother, who once shared the domain of beauty with her, but eventually fell and became instead the, the evil god of torture and imprisonment, whose domain also extends somewhat into the undead, though not as much as uh, Urgothoa, I suppose. So, wittingly or not, this uh, heretic seems to be more under the sway of Zan Kuthan than Shailen, because what he's doing would not please Shailen. It would just bring her more pain, because it would remind her about what had happened to her brother. Hard to say if it'll really have any bearing on our current campaign. We do have a cleric of Shailen who's joining us in Act 2. Um, but it may just be intended to illustrate, as we saw back in Kingmaker, that despite being the goddess of beauty... Uh, Shailen's worshippers are capable of some pretty ugly feats. Prodigal Sons It's done, I said. Milliken studied me with narrowed eyes. You look awfully clean, he said. Where's the knife? In answer, the first shouts went up from the inn. Fire, screamed Ilna, and then other voices joined hers. In an instant, Milliken's entrepreneurial instincts took over, and he sprang for the door, tossing the crossbow aside. Outside, the roof of the inn was already smoking, oily black, against the sunset, flames licking through the thatching in places. With a scream of pain, Milliken ran for the creek. I looked to Fargus. Needing no further cue, we each grabbed up armfuls of supplies and sprinted off into the opposite direction. After ten minutes of leaped brambles and ducked branches, we stopped to catch our breath. Back the way we'd come, the smoke was still visible, though the sounds had faded to just the faint and frantic pealing of a church bell. That was close. 
Vargas said, leaning against a tree and breathing hard. Agreed, I puffed, staring down at the cloak full of bread that now made up our sole possessions. Then the sound of the bell reminded me of something. About what you said back there, I asked. You said Shaylin. I thought you were a priest of Desna. Fargus grunted. The man's faith is a personal thing, he said, tying up the cloak. Now shut up and keep running. And we did. <laughs> I like that. No real bearing on things, I think. Just um, a fun little anecdotal story set in the Pathfinder setting. Sounds like two con artists almost getting caught in the act whilst ripping off an innkeeper. And uh, that final exchange shows that, of course, they can't even trust each other. Just how it goes when you make a living through graft and larceny, I suppose. You can't trust anyone, not even the people that you're relying on to help you commit those crimes. Especially not those people. Hey, future retcon here. Okay, so it uh, turns out that Fargus and his unnamed partner, in fact, the exiled Alix Kadar, last living son of Lord Kadar of Kadria, are very minor NPCs mentioned in Book 1 of the Kingmaker Adventure Path. So, mystery solved. Secret Overlords, the essence of the World Order. Until recently, we knew this world as it was described in books and stories. A sewer torn apart by hyenas that separate us with nations and borders, oppress us with extortion and lies, and assert their authority and power. However, someone else's hand rules these slaves who act like masters. It's a threat far more intimidating than a handful of arrogant fools. Our lands are secretly ruled by the most ancient creatures of Galerion, the inhabitants of the ever-dark depths, who know both past and future. People are led along paths they cannot see, and do not have the power to leave, to an end known only to our hidden masters. Some insist that the signs are purely coincidental, but they point to a vast conspiracy— only a fool can fail to see how the myriad coincidences weave into a great cobweb. Or they have submitted their very will and sworn their allegiance to our unseen masters in the depths. Wow. I mean, to be fair, uh, while this is obviously a, a nod to over-the-top conspiracy theories like the Illuminati or, or um, lizard people running the government... It's a lot less far-fetched when you bring it into a setting like Galerion, where you've got all these high fantasy elements, actual gods and aliens from space and other worlds. Or in this case, uh, specifically Lovecraftian entities, the Aboleths that lurk in the deepest depths of the ocean. I wouldn't be surprised if they were, in fact, running at least one or two kingdoms, though the entire world might be a bit much. You'd, you'd think that would run afoul of a number of other powerful entities. Though, uh, then again, Yogg-Sothoth is one of the two most powerful deities in the Pathfinder setting, so, uh, maybe? Shadows of Absalom by Pax Grumetra Nguan Quant peered through the slit in the window shutter. The visitor was staggering at the porch. Nuan had promised himself many centuries ago that he'd never have to deal with halflings again. Rude. After the case of the clockwork head. Even the bleaching is better than some adventures. However, there was something disturbing in the visitor's appearance. Something was wrong. What do you say, Kexi? His assistant sat at the next window, with yarn and knitting needles in her hands. Look at his clothes. They're secondhand. He's a hobo. He is, but you're not quite right. Look at his feet. Kexi looked, trying to make out at least something in the faint light of the lantern above the door. Are those... he was shackled? Rather than answering, the gnome stepped toward the door. We shall need a doctor. As if to prove his words, the guest faltered and collapsed onto the knees, and fell headfirst onto the doorstep. 
I do like that. I gotta say, some of these uh, short blurbs really make me wish they were actual books that I could read. In this case, it's uh, clearly a fantasy parallel to the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, with Nuan Quant being the gnomish stand-in for Sherlock himself, and uh, I guess uh, Kexi being the stand-in for Watson. I don't think the uh, title quite matches up to any of the original Sherlock stories. The closest I can think of would be would be a Game of Shadows, the, the Robert Downey Jr. adaptation from a few years back. I'll also note, um, this is definitely another carryover from Kingmaker. Apparently a lot of the books in in Horgus's library are, but in this case it's because I know that um, throughout the events of Kingmaker you can actually discover the fate of Pax Grumetra, the writer for this uh, particular piece of fanciful fiction. I'll leave it at that, since uh, I don't think we actually got that far in the Kingmaker series, but I would still like to. Almost done. The Crusades, as seen by Ordinary Folk, by Tullius Mara. A story recorded by Tullius Mara from the words of Warren, a peasant from the village of Darkfords. Want to know why they call old Genti the Crusader? This is what happened. Ogar the farmer died, leaving three sons. The two older ones divided the land and lived their lives. And Genti, the youngest one, was a square peg in a round hole, as they say. He only knew how to bask under a tree and eat pies. What was he to do? Where could he apply himself? So he got a rusty old sword from the blacksmith's backyard, mounted his skinny horse, and rode off, over the hills and far away. Sooner or later, he came to a castle. Inside it, there was a knight's wife, sitting around waiting for her husband to return from the Crusades. So Argenti sat down next to her, saying, Fair lady, your husband is a great man, and you deserve all compassion. I am a crusader myself, and used to fight the horrible spawn of the world wound. And so on, he rambled. He sat behind the stone walls for a month, gained ten pounds, became even more well-groomed and in the end looked like a baron. But he grew bored of the knight's wife. She was always pale and sad, and cried for days praying to Sarenray. So Genty waved her goodbye and went on his way. He rode and rode and saw a mill on a river, and a miller's wife, rosy cheeks, plump as a partridge. Argenti cozied up to her, saying, "'Lady Miller's wife, does your husband happen to be at home?' "'No, my good sir. Last year the Fae dragged him into the river,' she said. So Genty invited himself to stay at the mill. He lay in a soft bed, eating pies, drinking beer, and walking around the village. He had some nerve, told everyone at the village tavern what a seasoned crusader he was. He feared no demon, and promised to show them what's what. So, one moonlit night, when he was huffing and puffing on the widow, he felt her grabbing his back so strongly that he couldn't stand it. He looked down, and there she was, a crone, horrible, like a skeleton, with a crooked nose, eyes like embers, a hollow stomach, ribs sticking out, and claws instead of nails, stinking of a ripened grave. Try as he might, Genty couldn't get away. The crone held him tight, hissing, "'Where are you going, my sweet crusader? Come on, put your bun in my oven!' And she stuck out her long tongue and licked her rotten teeth. Somehow, Genty wiggled away, leaving plenty of his skin and meat on her claws. He ran from the mill in a panic, ran all the way to the village, naked and bleeding. So he's running and yelling, Demons! Demons! Well, the locals gathered with their axes and pitchforks and came to the mill. But it was empty. The crone was gone. They did find an ugly corpse in the basement, though. They knew it was the miller's wife by her hair and clothes. That's when Genty lost his mind. Now he sits under his brother's windows, staring into the distance, saying, The demons are coming. The demons are coming. That's the only thing he'll say. And, once again, not at all what I was expecting, based on that title, and the fact that we found it in, uh, Irabeth's house. She uh, specifically had it hidden away, and it is not the sort of reading material you would expect from, uh, someone as straight-laced as she is. That said, it is a very entertaining, if sordid, tale. Very, uh, very akin to your classic Tales from the Crypt type story. Some poor sap who wrongs others and then pays a, 
a terrible price for their hubris? Interesting, but uh, not particularly deep. I suppose there are some uh, names we can pull from this. Uh, Tullius Mara, obviously. Warren, Genti, and uh, the village of Dark Fords. So we'll add those to the lexicon and keep an eye out for them in the future, but I doubt... Well, no, I shouldn't say that. As I uh, just covered with Pax Rumetra, even the smallest details can end up coming back up in future, future events in uh, unexpected ways, so uh, that information may come in handy at some point. I guess we'll see. The Notes of a Traveling Priest, Hiltuliak, by Tyron Dean. Imagine this, a girl whose name I shall not disclose, comes to town and immediately purchases the most expensive suburban villa. This newcomer spends unfathomable amounts on charity, even returning several tragically perished citizens to life at her own expense. She's very young, her rough speech and manners indicate that she's not of noble birth. This leaves the whole town wondering, how did this young lady come into possession of such a huge fortune? And why does she spend it so eagerly? These secrets were revealed to me when I was invited to the mysterious girl's house to provide healing services. The young lady reluctantly displayed something she'd been hiding from everyone. Terrible acid burns. She forestalled any questions with a single word. Ilthuliac. The monstrous black dragon's name was well known in the River Kingdoms. She'd lived in the region for hundreds of years, inspiring terror and emptying settlements. Many experienced dragon hunters attempted to put a stop to her, and all perished. No one knew where Ilthuliac's lair was, or where she would strike next. The wounds Ilthuliac's acid breath left on my patient's body were terrible, but her soul was hurt much worse. The girl and her friends had found the lair of the dragon. They could have gathered hunters to destroy the monster, but they instead kept silent in search of profit. When the lair's mistress was absent, they would carry treasure out little by little. Ilthuliac suspected something was happening, so she set an ambush for the thieves, and they were dealt with cruelly. My patient pretended to be dead, surviving while the dragon devoured the bodies of her friends. She had much gold left at her disposal, but it came with a burden of memories that recalled devastated cities and countless people burned by acid. Unable to tolerate the guilt, the girl tried to atone for ill-gotten gains with good deeds. I was able to heal her physical wounds. When we parted, she told me she planned to spend the rest of her wealth organizing an expedition to Ilthuliac's lair to end the beast. I recently heard rumors that the villa has been abandoned for quite some time now. It's possible the owner left for other lands. But my heart tells me her bones lie in the lair of Ilthuliac. That winged terror and plague to the river kingdoms. And yet another carryover from Kingmaker. I think, um, I think about half the books we've read today are all from Kingmaker. I probably should have checked that in advance, but I guess it's a bit late now. Still, uh, that said, I don't think there's any real harm done, considering that uh, I don't think I read most of these books back in the original series anyway. I believe I was glossing over most of them for time. So, uh, better late than never? In this particular case, I believe Ilthuliac is one of several powerful optional bosses that pops up around Act 4 or 5 of the Kingmaker campaign, part of a, a grand optional quest that has the player hunting down powerful monsters all across the River Kingdoms. I suppose that means that as with uh, many of the details of the Kingmaker campaign, we don't know Ilthuliac's canon fate. I know in my campaigns I would generally take her down, she had some pretty decent loot, but uh, but we don't know if that's the case with the official ending for Kingmaker and whatever nebulous ruler ended up ruling the River Kingdoms. So, that uh, poor gal may or may not have been avenged. It's Schrodinger's Vengeance. And with that, we are done. Let's have a look at the... Zero bonuses that we gained for going through those books. 
Which is fine. I guess that makes sense if uh, if we assume that at least half of them were in fact from the previous game. It wouldn't make much sense to attach bonuses to them. And you know what? I don't really mind. The bonuses are nice, but they're they're often so circumstantial that a lot of them simply wouldn't apply to us anyway. That aside, I genuinely do enjoy reading the lore and the fiction of the setting, even if it is for the previous game. You know, it all uh, it all adds up. It all provides grander context for the events that we encounter, the creatures and the characters that we meet. For someone like me who is uh, largely unfamiliar with a Pathfinder setting outside of what I see in these games, it really is nice to have these sorts of anchors to the setting, things that I can use as reference points when I'm trying to tie all these disparate events together. And let's be honest, that is uh, first and foremost one of the things I really love about games like this. The story, the characters, getting invested and putting everything together. Though it certainly doesn't hurt if the game is also halfway decent. Anyway, we have accomplished what we set out to do, so let's hit the pause button for now. And we'll pick up here next time as the adventure continues. See you then! Oh, and remember, although I do love playing Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official social media feeds, or the official store pages. And if you'd like to help support the channel, then feel free to push the buttons that do the things, or maybe even uh, check out the Patreon. Links are in the description. <laughs>